Hey, welcome to another Thoughts on Thursday where I share what's on my mind and you share what you think about it in the comment section below. Like, subscribe, comment, share, and click that notification bell to be alerted when I post these videos. I'd appreciate it. And I just want to ask you guys to please share this channel because I really am trying to grow it. I would like to be monetized and I need at least a thousand followers to do that. It'd be great to have a little side gig, make some money. So I appreciate that very much. Um, if you guys follow my content, if you watch Music Mondays or Thoughts on Thursdays or both, and you're watching them every week, but you haven't subscribed, and you like it though, but you still haven't subscribed, please, please subscribe. Make sure that you're subscribed, guys. I appreciate it so much. And share. So today I'll be sharing what I learned in Lecture 4 uh, from The Great Courses Plus, not sponsored by them, uh, The Rise of Communism from Marx to Lenin. And this lecture is titled The 1871 Paris Commune as a Model of Revolt, taught by Dr. Vyas Gabriel Lulevichitz of the University of Tennessee. This is going to be more condensed since there wasn't a lot to it, and I actually want to get through this so that I can get to the communism and socialism in the news and vent, because I need to vent. So let's start. In this lecture, Dr. Vyas opens with, quote, it's May 1871, and we see before us the horrifying spectacle of the city in flames. No, not, uh, I'm sorry. Those are pictures from 2020 and the several cities that are in flames around the country. Um, uh, and one of those cities happens to be 15 minutes from where I live that I'm going to vent about later. But uh, that is not what we're talking about. We're talking about Paris. So Paris was on fire. There was a civil war taking place. It's thought that revolutionaries called the Paris Commune had set the fires on purpose. There was a lot of misunderstandings around the Paris Commune and the violent revolt that would form revolutionary legends that would be important to later communist movements. Marx and his enemies, enemies saw it as proof of, uh, of this influence, which wasn't the case. Marx also saw this revolution as a possible quote, breakout movement for his ideology. Few communards, now when I say that, the 14 year old boy in my head wants to laugh, um, but they call themselves communards, uh, <laughs> Few of them were Marxists, uh, but Marx was still blamed for this taking place, and this made him famous or infamous. Avea says, quote, the memory of the Paris Commune substantially and artificially reworked became a communist tradition and for Lenin and others a template for understanding later revolutionary action, end quote. The Paris Commune was a political experiment that lasted for 72 days from March 18th to May 28th, 1871. Sorry, that, that was a picture of the political experiment uh, in Seattle that took place from June 8th to July 1st, 2020. Uh, but that is not what we were talking about. We're talking about, again, Paris. Um, so how did the Paris Commune start? Or why did it start? So in 1851, Napoleon III, the nephew of the original Napoleon, uh, took over as emperor in a coup. He was mocked as Napoleon the Small by the people. Marx didn't like him either. Marx said history tends to repeat itself first as tragedy and then as farce, and he saw Napoleon III as a farce. A bad decision to go to war with Prussia was Napoleon III's downfall. Then a bunch of stuff happened. Germany took over for a bit. There was a provisional government. Parisians were afraid the monarchy would be reestablished. The government tried to disarm the National Guard troops in Paris, many of them workers, and this led to a revolt and the government troops were chased off. The provisional government pulled out of the city with the army to Versailles. Civil war was now taking place in France. A group called the Central Committee of the National Guard, a volunteer force of citizens in arms took over. The rich Parisians fled to the city of Versailles and the new Paris Commune was established. French writer Edmond uh, de Goncourt said, quote, what is happening is very simply the conquest of France by the worker and the enslavement under their despotism of the nobles, the middle class, and the peasants. The government is leaving the hands of those who have to go into the hands of those who have not." End quote. And Bismarck called the commune a pack of thieves. In Paris, uh, in the Paris Commune, the citizens were now its army. It planned to end public support for religion. Quote, it promised a 10-hour workday for laborers. It restored the revolutionary calendar from the first revolution. 
and recreated a committee of public safety, just like in the Reign of Terror in 1793, end quote. But soon the French government uh, army surrounded Paris and a bloodbath ensued and the city burned. But the commune would be defeated. In the meantime, Marx was living in London in exile. After the commune being mistaken, him being mistaken for the reason it happened, he became famous. He was very excited when the commune took over and he supported it from afar. He thought it was a sign of his predictions coming true. Marx said, quote, working men's Paris with its commune will be forever celebrated as the glorious harbinger of a new society, end quote. So Marx loved being blamed for the commune, even though that was a false claim. This created a legend and then became a part of the theory of revolution that would impact the future. In 1917, when the Bolsheviks took over in Russia, Lenin was determined to outlast the 72 days that the Paris Commune had. Um, the Bolsheviks cherished relics of the Paris Commune, so that was a big influence to them. The Commune, quote, as an episode, caused friction in Marx's group, the First International. The Brits that wanted peaceful change didn't like Marx supporting violent revolts. Marx didn't want to lose control of the First International, so he moved it to New York, but it ended up losing steam and disbanding. Shortly after Marx's health began to fail, he went to depression, he pulled back from political life. His wife Jenny died in 1891, and he followed in 1893. At his funeral, Engels said he'd been the greatest thinker, the man of science, but above all, a revolutionist, and that his name and work would live on. Unfortunately. He didn't say unfortunately. I say unfortunately. So Engels lived until 1895, and he completed the second and third volumes of Das Kapital. When he died, he willed the remaining remaining he willed his remaining fortune to Marx's two remaining daughters. But they both ended up committing suicide, so they all lived happily ever after the end. Uh, before we end, conclude our discussion on Marx's life. Uh, Dr. Bass ends with this quote from Marx, quote, men make their own history, but not spontaneously under conditions they have chosen for themselves, rather on terms immediately existing, given and handed down to them. The tradition of countless dead generations in an incubus or an inner demon to the mind of the living. At the very times they seem to be engaged in revolutionizing themselves and their circumstances and creating something previously non-existent in just such epochs of revolutionary crisis they anxiously summon up the spirits of the past to their aid, borrowing from them names, rally cries, costumes, in order to stage the new world historical drama." End quote. And there is the end of our journey into Marx's life. And I wish we were done. But I still have six more lectures to go through, guys. Ugh, thank you for bearing with me. Next week we'll explore Marxism after Marx. And uh, yeah, so now, is a time for communism and socialism in the news. All right, some of you may know, some of you may not. There have been riots taking place in Portland for almost 100 days. It could be 100 days now. I don't know. It's hard to keep track, but it's been constantly going. Uh, recently, there was a guy that people are claiming as a pro-Trump supporter. He was executed. Literally, he was walking away heading somewhere, I don't know, you hear people saying, I got one here, a Trumper or something, and the guy runs up and says this one and shoots him, dead. Um, I guess the, the guy that got shot, he was pulling out like mace or trying to mace or whatever, um, that was the extent of his weapon, not going to really do well against a gun, you know, he's dead and it's ridiculous and it frustrates me and I, it's just, there's so much, um, so much to say. <laughs> but I will, I will move on to the news articles. And again, these aren't necessarily uh, things that are socialism or communism, although I believe that ideology is alive and well in Portland. Black Lives Matter is there. They say that they're Marxists, um, or trained Marxists, some of them. Antifa, they're anti-fascist, but completely fascist uh, organization. They are ridiculous. They're almost white supremacist-like with some of the things that they say. You can see videos of cops being shouted down by these these uh, writers, why these Antifa people and some of the, the horrible um, racist things that they say, some black cops, you can find it. Just, again, this is a time that I'm gonna plead with you guys again, I'm gonna insert here. If you're just listening to mainstream media, if you just turn on CNN every night, if you just watch MSNBC, um, if you just watch, I mean, any of them, you know, Fox News, whatever, 
If you're just following the mainstream media, you're not going to get the full picture of what's happening. Listen to those sources, sure. Start to see the hypocrisy, actually. <laughs> it's frustrating to see the stuff that they talk about. And then go to independent journalists. Um, uh, let's see. Definitely, so Brandon Tatum has a Tatum report that has a bunch of, of sourced news articles that are supposedly 100% true. So the TatumReport.com has a bunch of articles that may not be in the mainstream. Tim Poole is my favorite. I have told you about him. Um, he is amazing. I would recommend following him every day. He posts a lot. Uh, so again, please, this is this is the time that you have to be doing your own research. You can't just be spoon-fed right now because you may be spoon-fed poison. <laughs> so it's important to be proactive with what you're hearing. And it's time to be awake and not asleep. So anyways, um, there there's there's some issues um, with the DA making the decision to let go any, any anybody that's been arrested during any of the riots, and that has led to death, three deaths that I am aware of. One was the situation with the Trump supporter, and there was also two people murdered, um, a woman and a man that were young in their 20s, I think, by a guy that was detained and let go. So it is very frustrating, but the thing that really has drawn my attention and, and kind of made me upset and um, I don't want to event about this is is a uh, article that I saw from Greg Goodman who is a property owner, owner in downtown Portland and I have met Greg Goodman he came into the office I used to work at I was in downtown Portland for nine years working at a real estate property management company my dad worked at that company he had been working in Portland he's retired now but he's he was working in Portland for like 40 years so glad that he's retired because there was 18 buildings that he managed. Um, he did the, the, the central air and heat in the buildings. So he was traveling all over Portland and God forbid he ran into one of these these situations with these rioters. Um, he worked during the day mostly, but he could have gotten called in if there was something that he needed to go in at night, early in the morning, whatever. Just glad that he's not in that situation anymore. Um, but again, uh, so Greg Goodman, they, so the Goodmans own a lot of the parking garages downtown, so like City Star Parking, that's all them. And he wrote a letter to Ted Wheeler uh, to plead with him to do something about these ongoing riots. So I'm going to read that letter to you. And this is what kind of spurred a lot of emotions in me thinking of, of working in downtown. I did not like the commute. I didn't really like the job. I loved the people I worked with. Um, it was kind of a posh job at the age I was. I was 20 when I got that job and I was making a lot more than a lot of my friends who were like baristas and stuff um, or working retail or whatever and they, uh, yeah, so that was um, a good opportunity for me. Uh, I squandered it <laughs> as a young person would. Uh, spent more than I should have. But, uh, you know, it was great, great people and I loved being downtown. I loved walking around. The city it was beautiful. I loved working in a high-rise building. Looking down at everything it's just, uh, you know, Portland Portland is is unique and I have always loved it um, and now it saddens me to see what's going on down there but um, so yeah that's why this really kind of hit a chord with me as as someone that I, I had worked with and that not worked with but come to my office in the past and I talked to on the phone that I was familiar with pleading with the mayor to do something it really sort of struck a chord in me and made me feel upset so this is a letter that Ray Goodman wrote to Mayor Ted Wheeler, this was posted uh, in an article in the Willamette Week. I will link all these articles in the description box for you to read. Uh, I'm not going to read every single one of them in detail, um, so check them out. So he says, Dear Mayor Wheeler and City Council members, I have attached an article from the recent British Journal relating to Standard Insurance, the largest private business in downtown Portland, moving their employees to their Hillsborough campus for safety reasons. A large number of businesses are moving out of or locating outside of the central city. These companies include Daimler, Chrysler, subleasing 100,000 square feet, Airbnb, Banana Republic, Microsoft, 80,000 square feet, plus permanently closing their retail store, Saucebox, etc. Google, who leased 90,000 square feet in the Macy's building, has stopped construction of their improvements. The list goes on and on. If you know retail or office broker, give them a call and ask them how many clients they have that are trying to leave. The number is like nothing I've seen in the 42 years of doing business in downtown. Their departure has absolutely nothing to do with Black Lives Matter movement, which has been a positive 
but does have most everything to do with the lawlessness you are endorsing downtown. I'm going to interrupt right there. And uh, I don't agree that Black Lives Matter has been mostly positive. I agree Black Lives Matter. Black people matter. People matter. Okay? Black people matter. Thank you. That goes without saying. The movement, I think, has incited more violence than helping. Um, during this time of the protests and the riots under Black Lives Matter, 30 people have died, including black people. That is more than supposedly what they're protesting, which is police brutality which uh, against black people, which in 2019, I believe there's only, or 2000, yeah, 2019, there's only 19 black people killed by white police officers, which is the, the Washington Post has been calculating, or not calculating, but um, reporting on and keeping that data, so you can look that up. And a few of those 19 actually were, were you know, the cop was at fault. It was a situation that shouldn't have happened. It was very bad. Uh, the other ones, people were playing stupid games and getting stupid prizes and putting themselves in positions where um, stuff happened. Again, I don't want to see death. I don't like police brutality. I think there needs to be reform. I think that there's, there is racism and, and stuff going on that needs change, okay? So I'm not saying anything against that. But I am saying that, statistically speaking, in a year's worth of time, 19 black people were shot by cops. In a, in a few months, 30 people have died, including children and, and again, black people, because of this movement. So I don't agree that it has mostly been positive. The only positive thing that I, I'll give them is, you know, working on issues within the police department and, you know, maybe having a, a better understanding of, of race relations in our country. But I think Black Lives Matter hasn't stood up enough against the violence that's happening in their name. And I don't think necessarily that it is what every person in Black Lives Matter thinks. I think Antifa is just kind of using that as a banner to hide behind to do their stupid, crazy whatever. So I really don't think that a lot of the riots that are happening in Portland especially have anything to do with Black Lives Matter at this point. And a lot of people, even in Black Lives Matter, agree. Do your research, you'll see, you can see, you know, all that stuff. Anyways, back to his letter. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so he feels that Ted Wheeler is endorsing the violence and the lawlessness downtown. So he says, you are doing an excellent job of enabling people who don't know or care about George Floyd to ransack our city at the expense of the people you are trying to help. Think how many jobs have been lost by people of color in our city, not through protest, but from vandalism. I would make the case that your actions have hurt those you have intended to help. I would encourage each of you to walk around downtown Portland in the morning. Name the time and I will give you a tour. You aren't sweeping the streets. Needles are all over the place. Garbage cans are broken and left open. Glass from car windows that have been broken out is all over the streets. Parks are strewn with litter. Their fountains turned off. Weeds are taller than the plants in the planter boxes. Graffiti is on sculptures, etc. You are willfully neglecting your duties as elected officials to keep our city safe and clean. What outreach have you had to small businesses and retailers to tell them that you have their backs and are going to help them? Your actions, or lack thereof, have been to the contrary. You've shown them you don't care, and as a result, a huge number of innocent and hardworking people have been victimized, with some being placed on the streets. I suggest all of you walk downtown, and when you see a shop or business that is open and not boarded up, stop in and talk to the owner or worker. Hear what they have to say. Ask what you can do for them. Let them know you care. As importantly, get going on cleaning things up. Get the streets swept. Double down on sidewalk washing and cleaning. Replace the burnt out newspaper boxes. Paint the light standards, get the parks in order, etc. Most importantly, show some pride. Own the situation and make it better. If you lead, others will follow. They just want to know you care and are doing something about it. Let them know we will get through this together and this is how the city is going to lead. Thanks for your consideration of my comments. Let me know how I can partner in your efforts. So good job, Greg Goodman. Um, what was the Ted Withers response? Um, as far as I know, there wasn't one. Um, so, uh, again, I just haven't done any research to see if, if he responded to that, but at the time he had not responded to that letter, uh, at least to the media. And I think he has been ridiculous. I think there's this elitist bunch of people like Ted Wheeler, like um, Governor Brown, like uh, Jenny Durkin, and Nancy Pelosi. We all know what she's been up to at the hair salon. Uh, it's ridiculous. It's this elitist attitude that I can do what I want, but you guys all have to follow me, and it's ridiculous. There are Antifa is not just staying by the courthouse or downtown. They have wandered into suburbs. They have been 
uh, late at night screaming no peace no no justice no sleep and, and yelling at people that if you're if you're you know trying to sleep because you have a job to go do tomorrow you have bought into the system or whatever and they've gone to, to neighborhoods that used to be mainly black owned homes and are yelling at those white people that they need to give their houses back to uh, to the black people even though those people obviously sold their houses and moved for whatever reason and I'm not saying that gentrification isn't something that happens but um, I'm pretty sure that 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 land was not stolen from them which some of the people are yelling that this land has been stolen from black people no they sold their house and moved um, and now you're yelling at these these people that live in this neighborhood it's just it's ridiculous and they've even gone into like more rural communities so they Antifa has been branching out everywhere and it's ridiculous and I don't I don't blame people like the Proud Boys and those kind of other people not necessarily you know I don't support these groups but even these people that want to come down and kind of counter because it's frustrating it's frustrating to see a group just going crazy every night for 100 days and 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 now people getting killed and the mayor doing nothing the mayor going down there at one point and saying that he's with them and he's with the movement and they're yelling at him to like to give up his job and they're saying because Antifa doesn't care again they're they're parading around with Black Lives Matter slogans it's not they don't care about that um, do your research see the videos guys there's so many there's so many videos Andy no he, he posts a lot there's a lot of independent journalists because again you may believe that Antifa is a myth you may believe that the riots aren't that bad or that yes yes the whole city isn't on fire okay there's probably places you can go where you can avoid Antifa and times that you could but the fact that it's happening it's take there's small groups there's a small group in Paris what we just talked about small group of Paris in Paris that took over and made everybody flee so it's not always that you need everybody in an uprising there's a few people that can get together and cause enough destruction that can really put uh, all of us in jeopardy and it, uh, yeah it's it's frustrating uh, and Ted Wheeler's response has been frustrating and Kate Brown's response the governor has been frustrating uh, President Trump has offered assistance the feds were here to protect their building um, but you know what? This is not a dictatorship. Trump just can't go into every state and do whatever he wants to. That's not the way we want it. Okay, we want to govern ourselves. We want each state to govern themselves, and that's what they're supposed to do. But when you are blatantly letting a bunch of people deal with this for a hundred nights, and people are getting shot, and just like in Chaz, Chop Chaz, you know, three people died, and it wasn't until they were protesting outside Jenny Durkin's house that she decided to stop Chop Chaz. Three people died. Okay, three people now died in Portland that I know. There could be more. A man just literally executed, just shot, point blank. Um, it's very upsetting. And again, seeing, listening to that letter and having Greg Goodman talk about, you know, walk around downtown. It, it just, I, I imagine myself walking around downtown. And if I saw the way it is, again, I haven't been down there in a while. Um, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to me. And I want to stop, and I don't know what to do, and I'm sure a lot of us just don't know what to do. But you know what? The government needs to lead. The government who is being paid by tax collectors, by tax collectors, is being paid by the taxes of the people need to do their job. And just allowing these people to run rampant for a hundred days, guys, needs to stop. It's just... So Ted Wheeler, now you know that Antifa or protesters have come to his home now, in his lobby, trying to set things on fire. The whole building could have gone up. They, they, they threw burning objects into the ground floor of the building. And if you think that they were just whatever, that that couldn't have, that wasn't attempted murder, it is. When you're going to throw fiery objects into a building, it could possibly go up in flames. And all the people above in that building could have been trapped and could have died. And so what does he do, though? He apologizes to his, his neighbors and says that he's moving. He's moving and, and he's sorry that they have to endure this fear and stuff because of his position. It's not about your position, Ted Wheeler, okay? It is about your inaction letting people run rampant for 100 days okay it's not because of your position that portland's falling apart all right it's because we're in action and then what do you do you move you move to some other location you spent eight hundred forty thousand dollars on this two-bedroom condo in northwest portland and uh yeah it's nice that you have enough money that you can relocate anywhere you want but there's some people that can't and they have to live with this they've been living with this for 100 days and it's ridiculous and, um, you know, because the, the person was shot, then Kate Brown wants to go into action. Oh, uh, okay, I'm going to do stuff, whatever. Um, but she, what she wanted to do, she didn't get the response from the, the sheriffs, 
and, and other counties. Um, I'll read that article in a second. But this article is is kind of Ted Withers' response after the man got shot. So this is from OPB. Um, Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler blames President Trump for downtown violence, of course, of course, because you got to blame Trump, right? And Nancy Pelosi, she has to blame the hairstylist. It's like a bunch of children, you guys. And it's like, oh, you know, and, and they're blaming Trump. They're saying that, oh, because of his rhetoric and how he's kind of a more violent guy or he's inciting all this violence or whatever. It's like, okay, <laughs> then there's something really wrong with our country if something that one person says is going to make people suddenly not have a moral compass and just do whatever they want and go crazy. You know, like when you're a kid and your sister or brother makes you do something or you, you say they make you do something or a friend and you're getting in trouble, you're like, well, she made me do it. How do you look at a kid that says that? It sounds like a bunch of children. It's like, okay, no, you have your own mind. You can make decisions on what's right and what's wrong. It's not that hard. And, you know, if you're following blindly what other people are telling you to do, then that's a problem with you. So, anyways, um, so this article... It says, the morning after a man was fatally shot amid conflicts between pro-Trump demonstrators and Black Lives Matter supporters, Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler and other leaders wasted little time Sunday blaming President Donald Trump for inciting hatred and violence. Quote, do you seriously wonder, Mr. President, why this is the first time in decades that America has seen this level of violence? End quote. Wheeler said in an afternoon press conference, quote, it's you who have created the hate and the division. End quote. Again, what I just commented. And there are so many people just falling for Trump's hate and division and doing things because of him. That's a problem with more than just him. Uh, there's an issue with people that are, are going to just snap and turn into crazy people because of one guy. Um, that's a problem. And I don't 100% agree if that's the case, by the way. So, uh, so saying that it has long been his greatest fear that someone would die as a result of growing unrest in the city, Wheeler urged calm from both Portlanders who have been protesting radical injustice and people on Twitter who, he said, have been threatening to seek retribution for the killings. Quote, the tragedy of last night cannot be repeated, Wheeler said. Quote, all of us must take a stance against violence. It does not matter who you are or what your politics are. Really? Really? Because I feel like you've been playing politics for a very long time. This is stupid. You're playing politics. And you say it doesn't? No. This is just dumb. Um, yeah. So, yeah, his greatest fear. It's because of him! This is, this blood in these cities that are going insane are on the hands of the leaders. Okay, it, you can't blame Trump because he is not a dictator. He doesn't command every state. This is in your power. So the blood is on your hands. It is their fault. It is Wheeler's fault. It is Kate Brown's fault. It is Jenny Durkin's fault. And there are people that are, that are issuing lawsuits in Seattle, I know. The guy that, that his son was shot, killed in Chaz, is suing the city. So, um, yeah you are going to take responsibility because you were the one who allowed this to happen. So whatever to that. Um, so then as far as Kate Brown wanting to, um, you know, get some, try to get some, some law enforcement going now, uh, in govern in, a, in Oregon to, or Portland, sorry, to stop what's happening because of the murder. Um, so this is in, this is Fox 12, Oregon. Uh, it says law enforcement agencies across Oregon respond to governor Brown's call to action. So uh, leaders across the state of Oregon have been calling to the end of the violence in Portland for more than three months. Governor Kate Brown issued a plan to help calm the unrest in Portland that would involve adding additional law enforcement resources from neighboring ju uh, jurisdictions to help Portland police. However, many neighboring law enforcement agencies are pushing back, saying they will not be sending any of their resources to help Portland. The Oregon Association of Chiefs of Police and the Oregon State Sheriff's Association released a statement that said in part, quote, due to the lack of support for public safety operations, the associated liability to agencies who would be assisting in Portland and the lack of accountability for those arrested committing criminal acts, we cannot dedicate our limited resources away from the communities we serve, end quote. Strong words came also from the Clackamas County Sheriff, Craig Roberts. He said it's not about adding resources, but changing policy. Roberts' statement said in part, quote, increasing law enforcement resources in Portland will not solve the nightly violence and now murder. The only way to make Portland safe again is to support a policy that holds offenders accountable for their destruction and violence. That will require the DA to charge offenders appropriately and a decision by the Multnomah County presiding judge not to allow offenders released on their own recognizance and instead require bail and conditions, end quote. So I think I, I did mention that the DA, you know, has decided that anybody arrested during these, these riots that have been going on for 100 days um, will not be prosecuted. They'll just, they're there and they, they're let go. So that happened to the man who just executed that so-called supposed Trump supporter. 
Um, he was arrested and he had some criminal background and he was let go and he killed someone. That man who killed the woman and man, the two young people, uh, he was also arrested and let go, even though he had prior issues as well. You can look them up. Um, so again, three people dead because of stupid decisions that, oh, it's fine that these people are protesting or protesting, they're rioting, and if they're detained, we'll just let them go, and then they're back at it, and the cops say that, that these people, they detain, bring them in, they see them again the next night. It's, it doesn't make any sense. It's so frustrating. Um, so that's that article, again, in the link if you want to read the whole thing. Uh, and then this last one that I want to end with, it's just, so this is, uh, the Oregonian. Pro-Trump supporter who shot paintballs into downtown Portland crowd is sued for $250,000. So there was a woman who was injured by a paintball that was fired uh, by a pro-Trump supporter during a clash between right-wing and opposing demonstrators in downtown Portland last month, has filed a $250,000 lawsuit against the man she says shot her. And she's complaining that, oh, she was just there to observe, and she has an injury now, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So who who's going to sue Antifa for, I don't know, damaging businesses? I mean, it's just... This is what they're focusing on. They're focusing on a guy who shot a paintball. How about the guy that was executed? How about the guy that was let go and then stabbed two people and killed them? Um, she gets hit by a paintball, which there's a lot worse things in life, like, you know, uh, getting shot and killed for no apparent reason. Um, yeah, I don't want people to get hurt. I don't want people to die. And But you're stupid if you go down there and think that you possibly can't get hurt by something on either side, guys, because either side is crazy. I don't agree. With, with, with Antifa, I don't agree with Proud Boys. I think people need to back off and let the city destroy itself with them not doing anything. Let Antifa just go crazy until everyone realizes it's so stupid. Um, and yeah, I don't think going down there and trying to antagonize or just... I get it. We all have a right to free speech. We all have a right to peaceful, peacefully assembly. Peacefully assemble, sorry. Um, I'm for that, okay? But at this point, I don't think trying to to uh, to go and, and, and counter-protest Antifa is really doing anything because they're just going to be violent. And you can tell me that there's violence on both sides. Yes, there is. But if you look at the majority of the violence, again, I tell you to look online. You will see lots of videos. Um, the Colored Conservatives, Andy No, um, Tim Pool, and uh, there's lots of, of videos. And again, just because you hear the word conservative doesn't necessarily mean they're bad people. I hate that I have to be like, oh, this person supports Trump, but please, just listen to what they say. They're cool. Uh, we need to listen right now. Um, there's a lot of talking and not enough listening. And here I am talking at you. But there, you really need to listen to all sides. And, you, and, and if you're smart, you'll see for yourself and you won't be spoon-fed crap or getting brainwashed or gaslit or whatever. Just look all around and, you, and you'll start being, you're, you're all smart. You'll put two and two together and you'll start to see the craziness. Um, which is why I'm here. A person that was never political is doing this right now. So anyways, yeah, this woman's crying about being shot, but whatever. It's just ridiculous that they, they, this is a point, but there's people being killed and someone, you know, somebody shoots a paintball. There's a lot more things to get upset at. And also, if you're going to be down there, you might get hurt. So it doesn't take a rocket science to figure that out. There's a lot of unrest. And again, maybe she's following mainstream media and doesn't know what's going on and thinks that Antifa is a myth, like some people are saying, or that the riots really aren't that bad in Portland. It's just a small group. Just, it's fine. Peacefully protesting, mostly. No. No, yeah. If you're smart, you, you won't go down there. Um, so, anyways, and, oh, side note, reminds me. I don't know if you if you listen to a lot of the Antifa videos of people attacking people, like, especially the RNC after those people were leaving and walking in there getting attacked by Antifa. There's these women, several women that I've had watching these, that I've seen watching these Antifa videos. Those whiny, screechy, annoying voices, and I can't handle it. It's so annoying. So, for some reason, I imagine this woman has a screechy voice, but... I get it. She got hurt, right? It's not okay. It's not okay to hurt people. It's all frustrating. Anyways, so that's my, my venting session today. I'm going to end there and just say I want to stop, and it's frustrating, and I hate seeing what's happening in Portland because I do love that city, and I have family members that live there, people I know that work there, that still work at that same company, but I'm sure are having to deal with this. I, I should talk to some of them and maybe report back on how these property managers are dealing with some of the stuff going on property managers see a lot of crazy things um anyways so that's all i have for you today thank you so much for being here with me for listening to this i don't know if i went a little long or not today but i apologize if so we'll be back next thursday with the uh lecture five about marxism after marx marxism after right okay anyways <laughs> thanks so much you guys and remember these thoughts are my own 
if you don't agree with me, we might not agree, and it's fine, but I still love you. 